have here? We have a traditional, if you will, scene, but it's certainly not painted in a traditional way. And Vincent was getting grief every step of the way. He would send these paintings to his brother to look at. Theo, oh, uh, Theo by the way, was in uh, Paris by now, again working for Uncle Sint and having a degree of success there in the gallery, knowing young artists, the, the group uh, that was effectively the avant-garde, and selling rather well. So Vincent would send these works to Teo, of course with the hope that they would be sold in the gallery. That never happened. But Teo would write back to him and give him his thoughts. Sometimes they were good. Usually they were highly uh, instructive, but a bit tough for Vincent to take. And he would fall into a deep depression, have a, a if you will, a major mood swing when he would get the, uh, the letter back from his brother. And that happened again and again and again. But again, I mentioned the Rijksmuseum in 1885. Well, Vincent was looking again at the works of Delacroix and Daumier and the dark natural tones of the realists and the romantics but he was also falling into serious debt. And he was writing to Teo more and more to help him out. And he pushed Teo pretty hard. And finally, Teo said, all right, come to Paris, live with me. I can't afford this anymore, Vincent, and we'll see what we can do. Teo was nearly distraught when he realized that he was going to have to have uh, allow Vincent to move in with him. He knew what he was getting into. Now, Teo was surrounded by this group that I mentioned of avant-garde painters. Who were they? Pizarro, Gauguin, Emile Bernard, Georges Seurat, Toulouse-Lautrec. They all knew Teo Van Gogh. They all, by and large, liked Teo Van Gogh. But Vincent, the argumentative brother, was about to move in. This, by the way, is one of the first self-portraits that Vincent created when he moved to Paris. This is one of 18 uh, that he made when he was there during that two-year period. We know of 36 self-portraits that Vincent created. There might be more, but we doubt it because there is no documentation. And again, this obsessive individual, thank goodness he was as obsessive as he was, about documenting what he was doing, because he has, in fact, given us a very good idea of what is out there or what might be out there. So Vincent, he's traveled from originally the Dutch Brabant to Den Haag to London, back to the Borinage, and now he's come to Paris. The year is 1886, and again, he'll spend two years with Theo. It was hellish. He was constantly outspending what Teo could allow. Teo didn't have all the money in the world. He did have enough if Vincent used his head. Vincent immediately went out and found a bigger, uh, more elegant apartment and one with an extra bedroom. This was practically unheard of for someone at their social and economic level and he rented it without discussing it with his brother. Everybody moved in, and what I mean by that is Teo's friends would come over. Uh, there, was a, there were a lot of individuals coming and going. Why? Teo had held the promise that their works were going to sell. So uh, in, uh, added to the fact that Teo was so personably uh, easy going and uh, fun to be around as an individual, he was also responsible for getting work for these people and getting commissions for them. And so people were coming and going out of this apartment. That line of people was going to dry up because everyone who came through that door ran the risk of getting into an argument with Vincent. Probably you could ask Vincent the time of day and you were going to end up in an argument. By the way, Notice how it's painted. We won't see the rest of the self-portraits that we examine today looking at all like this. What was Vincent doing? He was trying to acclimate, was he not? He was trying to get along with that young, with it group that was surrounding his brother. And he was trying mightily hard. 
By the way, please notice the hat and notice the jacket because you'll see them recur time and time again. Here is a work that Vincent painted right after he was exposed to Japanism. Now, if we backtrack just a little bit, back to 1853, as a matter of fact, Commodore Perry had been sent to Japan to forcibly open it to trade. Japan had been um, a closed, its borders had been effectively closed for 200 years. And times changed in 1853. They were horrified by the huge black ships of, of Commodore Perry. And when he instructed them to open their borders, they did. But what came back? What went back and forth in trade? Well, what came from Japan were prints, beautiful, beautiful, Yukio-e prints, uh, porcelain, other ceramics, clothing, uh, beautiful fabrics. And what went to Japan? Well, it was the camera that we mentioned early on. So the ability to document. Now, France was benefiting from these, this largesse of these prints coming in. So was Amsterdam. And Vincent was transfixed by all of this. As a matter of fact, Sigmund uh, Bing had a uh, gallery uh, a shop, if you will, quite large, where he had all of these imported goods. And among them, he had so many of the prints coming from Japan. He was only down the street from Vincent's and Teo's new apartment. So Vincent would go down there, and he'd spend hours and hours poring over these prints, and oftentimes he would buy them. How did he do that? On credit, of course. And Teo would be left with the bill. At one point, they had over 2,000 prints. Remember we talked about his early collections? Well, this didn't necessarily change. It's just that the obsession changed. And so Vincent was building his new collection, but it was costing him a lot more than those early ones ever did. So here they were flooded with Japanese prints, but Vincent was pouring over every one. No one has ever uh, declared him to have a photographic memory, but I would say that his memory comes awfully, awfully close. And as a matter of fact, when he would pour over information about artists and artists' works, Teo would use Vincent as, if you will, an encyclopedia, a walking encyclopedia of information on these artists. And in that way, they could bond. And Vincent was delighted that he was needed, at least, for something. Here's an example, a particularly interesting one, of the Japanese Yukio print type. What do we mean when we talk about these Japanese prints? We're talking about images that look simple, but yet are quite sophisticated. There's a nuance of tone and color. There's an elegance of line. And you'll see these thin, fluid, sensual black lines flowing through these Japanese prints again and again. What were they too? They were sedate. They were delicate. They were sophisticated. They were all the rage. Now, the two principal artists early on of the Yukio print were um, uh, Hokusai, and that is the gentleman that you might be quite familiar with. You have probably seen prints of the studies from Mount Fuji. Those were the early uh, Hokusai prints, and also Hiroshige. And Vincent knew much about both of those artists. And by the way, this is the cover from a, a Parisian journal and that is, on the right, that is a hokusai. So this image right here is taken as a reproduction from a hokusai Yukio-e print. This is another journal cover. And this image, the courtesan here, oops, well, I just gave the game away, didn't I? All right, this one comes from Hiroshige. What Vincent did is he took what he called a perspective screen. And he laid it down, essentially a small frame with lines drawn, uh, uh, tacked on with either thread or wire. And he would lay it down over a piece that he wished to copy. And then he would copy grid square to grid square. And so this is his painting derived from that Hiroshige image. Now again, he called it the courtesan. It was painted in 1886 
when he was in Paris, being highly influenced, of course, by these things. The pigments are becoming bright, and he's beginning to study color theory. We could talk for hours about color theory, but basically what it was about for Vincent, who had a formidable mind, was when you use complementary colors juxtaposed one against the other, there is a vibration that is set up in the human eye that essentially fights that, that makes it very exciting, if you will, to look at. The human eye, or I should say the human brain, may not exactly understand what it is that's so engrossing about this. But we are very much um, excited by those kinds of images. Years ago, I went up to the, uh, the museum up at the University of Texas, and there was a painting on the wall that was nothing but horizontal stripes of red and green. Bright red, bright green, red, green, all the way down. And it meant nothing to me. And I was across the hall, and I looked at it, and beyond anything else I saw in there, it just riveted my glance. So I started walking towards it. I got within probably 10 feet, and my eyes literally started to hurt. And I couldn't, I couldn't look at it anymore. So I turned around and walked back, tried it again, because that's the way we're made, isn't it? It's like, what was that? Went back, tried it again. Didn't know. This was, oh, probably 15 or 20 years ago. I didn't know anything about color theory. I just knew this thing was affecting me, and it was upsetting me somehow. I did that three times before I gave up. I went home, and I started doing research. Those were the complementary colors, red and green, doing battle in front of my, this camera, my eyes, and it was a very exciting but upsetting experience. This, I'm making light of color theory, which we could talk about for days, but when you take purple and you juxtapose it against yellow or blue against orange, red against green, this is effectively the response that the human eye has. Had. Vincent was looking at this, and he was getting very excited about it. How do I draw people into these paintings? How can I change what I do? How can I take what I look at and define it in a better way without being, if you will, hyper-realistic, without doing it correctly, but doing it in a new way? By the way, there is, you might be able to see a crane, two cranes up here and a frog down here. Vincent did again have a sense of humor. These were references to French prostitution. So he did have his fun. And by the way, yes, he did visit brothels virtually every, everywhere that he was. And Vincent contracted syphilis. And now we're starting to add, are we not? We know about epilepsy. We're descri we describe something that is, is becoming, if not originally, bipolarity. And now we're adding syphilis to this. So times are truly, in a physical sense, a mental and emotional sense, getting tough for Vincent. This is another piece that he painted when he was in Paris. I find it particularly interesting because this is a portrait of a gentleman by the name of Pierre Tanguy. And Pierre Tanguy ran a, an art gallery and was an art supplier. What's fascinating to me is that particularly the yellows and the reds that Pierre Tanguy sold to this avant-garde group, and Georges Seurat bought from him, Cezanne bought from him, Van Gogh, of course, they were inferior paints. And there are many Van Goghs, as vibrant as they are today. And for those of you who have been to the Van Gogh Museum, you do know what I'm talking about if you haven't seen him in many other places. Uh, most of us have probably seen um, Van Gogh in a, in a rather up close and personal way. But to backtrack just a little bit, Per Tanguy sold inferior pigments of, of, of particularly red and yellow. Um, not too long ago at the MFA, we had a painting, many of you might remember it, uh, it was in an upstairs gallery. I'm trying to remember who owned it. It might have been during the, I don't believe it was the MoMA show. It might have been the Met show. It might belong to the Met. This beautiful big painting of white flowers. 
Those flowers were not painted white. In Vincent's correspondence, he describes them as vibrant yellow. So this gives you an idea about these pigments. But here we have Pertangi, and he's sitting in his gallery, and he's surrounded by none other than these rather incredible works. We've seen her before. Here is Mount Fuji from the series by Hokusai. It goes on and on and on. Japanese is everywhere. And all of France, not to mention Paris, is fascinated by these things. There was much money to be made, but the prints themselves remained rather cheap. Thank goodness. By the way, Pere Tanguy was giving credit to more, than, to more individuals than Van Gogh, but again, Theo would get a letter or a, or a visit and find out that he owed another small fortune. Vincent couldn't control it. Up on the, on the upper left, we have Vincent and, uh, with his back to us, unfortunately, but he's sitting there uh, in Paris um, and this might have been either near or on the, in the Tuileries, but there, I would imagine there'd be more happening there. But that is Emile Bernard, uh, the young artist talking to him. And Bernard was only 16 uh, when he came to Paris and befriended Vincent. And it's, it's arguable that he befriended him because his brother was Theo, who had the ability to perhaps sell some of Bernard's works. And this happened quite a bit to Vincent. And he would be destroyed each and every time he would discover that someone really didn't care for him. And down on the right, you might recognize Toulouse-Lautrec in his studio. Now, several of these young men were taking lessons from an aging artist by the name of Fernand Cormon. And he had a atelier, a, a studio. And they would come in. And Lautrec and Engatin, another young artist, really ran the show. The, the owner, uh, Cormon, came in not too regularly. And these young men were, as young men can often be, perhaps you think in terms of a boarding school, uh, a little tough on some of the, the other members. So you can imagine who got the brunt of it. So it was Vincent van Gogh, time and again. And he didn't last too long at Cormon's studio. But what he did come away with was a friendship, if you will, with uh, a number of them who acted effectively as protectors. And it's very interesting to me that Toulouse-Lautrec would act as a protector to anyone. Um, those of you who've read his letters and know much about Lautrec, he was a pretty tough number himself. Here is a Lautrec pastel of Van Gogh. And if you look carefully, you will see a glass in front of him filled with a fairly clear uh, uh, liquid, and that's absinthe. Absinthe would eventually be declared illegal. It was so potent that it was, in fact, killing people with addiction. But here is Vincent sitting in a cafe, and probably Lautrec, in all of the use of colors, was, if you will, maybe making a little bit of fun at Vincent with the introduction of all the wild colors. And these were wild, if you will, to, to Lautrec. He used color in a powerful way, but he didn't normally use them like this. So this was probably part of the statement that he was making about Van Gogh. OK, here's the man of modern color theory. Here, Vincent, take a look at this. This is a painting that was done by one of the more traditional young men at the studio. Uh, John Peter Russell, who is actually an Australian, and here he is. So he would wear his cowboy hat around Paris. He was quite the thing. Here's his portrait of Vincent. Very traditional, very uh, much a chiaroscuro portrait, but look at those eyes. It's a pretty powerful piece. Russell was looking at the romantics. And he was eager to sell, eager to be accepted into the French Academy, which was still ongoing. And this is what Vincent created of himself, one of his next self-portraits. It's simply called Self-Portrait in Gray Hat. 
It's from 1887. Notice again the suit. This is a young man who couldn't afford to change clothes very often. He was fighting daily with Teo. They weren't getting along at all. And he was starting to have greater and greater delusions. So hallucinations, if you will. Here is another piece, one of the most beautiful ones that I've seen of Van Gogh's. Um, recently, I was lucky enough to see the exhibit in Philadelphia, and this piece was included in that show. And I'd never seen it in person before. But the strokes are magnificent. The color use is as well. These are, of course, cut sunflowers, and that's the title of the piece from 1887. But Vincent was wearing out his welcome. Teo said, you've got to go. You're scaring people out of the gallery. I can't sell work anymore. If you want me to support you, you're going to have to leave. Vincent, find a place. And Vincent did. And if we look at this, Again, here's up here is the Dutch Borinage, Paris, and Vincent went all the way to Arles. So we're talking every bit of probably 700, 750 miles. Now, Arles had been established in the 6th century BC, uh, and it, was, it became a very strong uh, Roman port city with an amphitheater and so much that remained of a great Roman town. But Arles, by the time that Vincent got there, was a bit sleepy. But it did have a number of vibrant, if you will, uh, brothels. And Vincent spent a great deal of time and a great deal of money trying to find the companionship that he couldn't find in any other way by paying for it.